According to U.S. and German authorities, the Hamburg cell began when Muhammad Atta, Mawan al-Shehi, and Ramzi bin al-Shib moved to Germany and rented an apartment in the Mannstraub located in Hamburg on November 1st, 1998. The men would frequent the Al-Quds Mosque, where a known radical imam from Morocco, Muhammad al-Fazazi, would give fiery lectures about the immorality of the world which desperately needed Islam, most notably the West. Friday evenings would generally have up to 250 people listening in to Fazazi, who was a Sunni Wahhabi believer himself. However, German authorities from the BFV had begun monitoring the mosque due to the fiery lectures and the anti-Western sentiments. Atta grew up in Egypt. His father, Mohammed El-Amir Awad El-Sayed Atta, was a lawyer educated in both Sharia and civil law. His mother, Bouthaini Mohammed Mustafa Sharaki, came from a moderately wealthy family, was also educated in many areas. Atta, in his early formulative years, was an insular child who excelled in his studies. He graduated from Cairo University and was considered an average student. Meanwhile, Egypt under Hosni Mubarak during the early 90s was a hotbed for Islamic extremism. Between 1992 and 1998, Military courts tried more than 1,000 civilians in mass trials, most of them alleged members of the Al Jihad or the Gamma Islamia. In 1992, Atta, according to Egyptian intelligence reports posted in The Guardian in 2001, joined the Engineers Syndicate, one of three professional associations controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. One day, his father had over a German couple who were visiting Egypt's capital. The unnamed couple began to tell Atta about a student exchange program that would help him in his studies. Six months later, Atta would leave for Germany. He would end up enrolling at the Hamburg University of Technology. The German couple, high school teachers, would allow Atta to stay with them until he got situated. But the couple found Atta to be rather insulated and introverted. He began strict diets under Islamic law and began frequenting local mosques. By 1994, Atta's professor, Ditmar Machul had invited him to travel with him to Aleppo in Syria. There, Atta would begin his thesis and began to travel to Egypt back to, in his hometown in 1994 to visit his family. By late 95, he visited the Al Quds Mosque located in Hamburg. The mosque adhered to a harsh, uncomprising, fundamentalist, and resoundingly militant version of Sunni Islam. Atta would become one of its loyal members shortly thereafter. He would also start friendships here. Two of the first acquaintances he met were Munir al mutasadek and Ramzi bin al-Shib. Al-Shib would also teach classes here. By April 11th of 1996, Atta had signed his last will and testament at the mosque, which also happened to be the day Israel attacked Lebanon in Operation Grapes of Wrath, which gave him the vigorous motivation to dictate his will. As for the others, Ramzi bin al was born and raised in Yemen, his family known as working class people where his father died, where al Shib was very young. He would work numerous jobs until 1995, where he would finally apply for a U.S. visa. His request was denied by U.S. officials. While in Germany, he frequented the mosque. While he met Atta and Marwan al Shehi here, and later, Ziad Jaran. Marwan al Shehi was born and raised in the United Arab Emirates. His father, a Muslim cleric, and his Egyptian mother, a devout wife, who kept to herself. His father would die in 1997. His early years are quite unknown, but what is known is that the neighbors of the al Shehi family knew them as quiet people. In 1995, he graduated high school and he enlisted in the military, was admitted on scholarship to travel to Germany to continue his studies. Al Shehi arrived in Germany in April of 1996 and moved into an apartment which he shared with three other scholarship students for two months before boarding with a local German family. Several months later, he moved into his own apartment. Those who personally knew him while in Germany describe him as being very devout in his Islamic faith. He wore westernized clothing. He would travel to many European countries. In 1998, he moved to Hamburg and would frequent the Al-Quds Mosque where he would become more radical in his views regarding the Muslim faith. It was here he would meet Atta and Ramzi bin al-Shib. 
Ziad Jara was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon, near the Baca Valley, where the Shiite community thrived. His father is a mid-level bureaucrat, and his mother, from a well-off family, is a teacher. The family is well-to-do and often drives their Mercedes while Jara attends private Christian schools. His mother and father, although Sunni Muslims, were secular in their beliefs and lifestyles. Jara, at a young age, always dreamed of flying planes. His father, Samil al Jara, discouraged him early on, worrying that he might crash. Jara had loved sports, particularly swimming and basketball. He drank alcohol and also had girlfriends. He was rather affable and sociable to everyone. In 1995, Jara moved to Yemen, and in the spring of the next year, Jara had moved to Germany with his second cousin, Salim al Jara, both enrolled at the University of Griswold. He shared an apartment with Salim. Both would attend parties and discos, and quite amical. It was here he met his future girlfriend, Azel Sanguin. After a year, he moved to Hamburg, where he registered at the University of Applied Sciences. Sanguin moved to Bochum, Germany, where she pursued her study to become a doctor. In 1997, Jara left Griswold and began studying aerospace engineering at the University of Applied Sciences in Hamburg while working at a Volkswagen paint shop. By 1997, late in the fall months, Muhammad Atta would grow a full beard and began teaching classes at Al-Quds Mosque. Jara would have his own apartment in which he rented from Rosemary Canal. It was here that Jara would frequent the Al-Quds Mosque. It is not exactly known at what day, but it happened during the four months of 97. Also in this year, Al-Qaeda militants would also visit the mosque. Mohammed Haydar Zamara, a Syrian-born militant who had numerous connections in the Islamic extremist underworld and also has contacts with criminal organizations in Germany, Morocco, and Syria. German authorities have once tried to turn him as an informant, but with no luck. Beginning in the spring of 97, neighbors of Atta would often see Zamara carrying boxes up to the Egyptian student's second-story walk-up. U.S. investigators believe he may have persuaded Atta's Islamic study group to offer its services to Al-Qaeda. Later in the year, Atta, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, and two of their associates, Mohammed Haydar Zamar and Mohammed Belfast, would find employment at a small Hamburg area computer company called Hay Computing Service. Another Al-Quds visitor and close associate to Zamar was Mamoun Darkanzali. Darkanzali was also Syrian born, who had bank accounts in his name while deposits came from Saudi businesses in the late fall of 97, Darkanzali would receive a $250,000 deposit from a Saudi public company called the Tawaya Group. Darkanzali would frequently become sociable to Atta, al Shehi, and al Shib during this period. Interestingly enough, it is said that out of the Hamburg cell, Ziad Jara would only be seen a handful of times with the group. Jara lived alone, constantly, and separate from the members and can be confirmed to only have met with any of them in Hamburg on a single occasion, that of Saeed Bahaji's wedding at the Al-Quds Mosque in October of 99, per the 9-11 Commission final report. However, during 1998, Jara would begin a friendship with a known Islamic militant named Abdul Rahman al-Makadi, known publicly as Mr. K. Jata would frequently meet with Mr. K during the year and also call him during important incidents and events, even just prior, weeks prior to the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. It is not known what had become of al-Makadi other than a known connection to a Muslim mosque in Germany. While they returned to Germany, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed starts visiting Atta in Hamburg frequently. He also rents an apartment here. Just two years prior, per the New York Times report, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is reported from Philippines draft reports, as well as official reports in their interview and interrogation of a Bajinka plotter named Abdul, Abdul I'm sorry, Hakim, Abdul Hakim Arad. During these interrogations, Murad had stated that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had traveled to the United States and Israel. It is not known when exactly he traveled to Israel, but in the United States, 
he traveled frequently as he was a university degree student in North Carolina. Keeping close contact with them by this time, German intelligence monitors the apartment in 1999, but apparently does not notice Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. According to German investigators, by at least this time, the Al Qaeda Hamburg cell, including Mohammed Atta, Al Shehi, Ziad Jara, and Ramzi Belshib, had come up with the idea of attacking the United States using airplanes. This theory is based on witness statements and the discovery by the German police of a flight simulator file on a computer used by the Hamburg cell that was downloaded between January and October of 1999. The German intelligence agency, the BFB, monitors Haydar Zamar, who temporarily lives with Atta, Saeed Bahaji, and Ramzi bin Alshib. They live in a four bedroom apartment at 54 Mannstrasse in Hamburg. It is also said that the CIA is also monitoring Zamar as well, but it is unknown how long. Meanwhile, they tried to recruit him as an informant. It is not known whether he became one or rejected the offer. They later would then propose that Marmoon Darkanjali inform on the members of the Hamburg cell. Meanwhile, in the spring of 99, Atta takes flying lessons in the Philippines and Marwan al Shehi is with him. Also at this time, Jara had an unofficial wedding with Adil Sanguin at the Al Quds Mosque. A photo of Jara's wedding pic with many members of the Al Quds Mosque would be filmed in Azil's home days after 9 11, in which the Hamburg Intelligence Agency, the LFV, the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution, would find out that 18 of the 22 people in the said pic by name would be Al Quds members. This suggests that German intelligence would have a mole inside the cell in 99, for the mole is the one who showed him the picture that was found in Sanguin's home. Zamar would begin having regular contact with senior Al-Qaeda operational coordinators. US intelligence, most notably the NSA and CIA, would not contact German authorities of Zamar. Instead, they listened in to his phone calls and started monitoring his every move. Germans are given evidence from Turkey that Zamar is running a travel agency as a terror front in Hamburg. By late 1999, Mohammed Atta, Emar and Al-Shehi, and Ramzi bin al -Shib traveled to the Netherlands to hold a meeting. It is here that they met with Associate Munir al montesek who in turn is given funding from an unnamed Saudi financier. In late 99, Atta, Jara, and Al-Shehi would be appointed at the pilots for the planes operation plot by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Osama bin Laden. While in Afghanistan, they were selected as the pilots for they had experience living in Western society and are well-educated and even speaking English. According to information from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and al Shib, years after 9-11, all three went to Kandahar in Afghanistan where they met with bin Laden personally. This information should be taken with a grain of salt since both Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin al Shib have been tortured by the CIA. They all had pledged bayat, loyalty to bin Laden, in which bin Laden had accepted. On their return journey, Atta left Karachi, Pakistan on February 24, 2000, by flight TK-1057 to Istanbul, where he changed to flight TK-1161 to Hamburg. Immediately after returning to Germany, Atta, Al-Shehi, and Jar reported their passports stolen, possibly to discard travel visas to Afghanistan. By January of 2000, they would begin their plans to travel to the United States and begin their final operation. Meanwhile, two other Saudis had arrived inside the United States after leaving an Al-Qaeda high-level meeting in Malaysia. Khalid al-Midar and Nawab al-Hazmi had landed on LAX airport on January 15th of 2000, where a hotel room at the Radisson was awaiting for them by an unnamed person who paid for their rooms. The Hamburg cell at no point being 1998 to 1999 
were they not under intelligence watch, either from the BFV, the LFV, the German intelligence apparatus, or from the CIA and the NSA. According to CIA documents, Marmoon Darkanzali had turned down the offer to become an informant to the agency. However, the NSA had begun listening in to Zamara's phone calls, and the CIA kept pressuring him, knowing that he was a well-known Al-Qaeda contact between Germany and Afghanistan, as well as being a heavy recruiter, gunrunner in Syria and Germany. His connections would prove invaluable. Meanwhile, the NSA had kept track of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Khalid al-Madar and Nawab al-Hazmi, not just abroad, but also inside the United States. Both al-Madar and al-Hazmi had lived with an FBI informant named Abdus Sheikh, who was being a contact between the San Diego field office of the FBI and the Muslim community. The Hamburg cell had arrived inside the United States but a mysterious background surrounding Ziad Jara was not known, obviously, to the members of the Hamburg cell or to Al Qaeda. His uncle and cousin both had Israeli intelligence backgrounds. Ali Al Jara was an informant for the Mossad for 25 years while living in Lebanon and informing on Hezbollah the militant political group and military arm of Lebanon. His brother, Joseph Aljara, Ali Aljara's brother, is said to have helped him for the last 10 years. Meanwhile, his cousin, Assem Aljara, was an Israeli and Syrian and Libyan intelligence agent for over 15 years, becoming also an agent of an Abdul Nadal organization, an Arabic semi-political terrorist organization. These background profiles should have been known to Al Qaeda before accepting to Ziad Jara in their ranks. Or was it easy to infiltrate this group, which would lead many to think, who else have infiltrated Al-Qaeda and how far did they get? 